Hey everyone, Reflected here, and today is the 42nd anniversary of the maiden flight of the mighty F-14 Tomcat, the most legendary fighter to ever take the skies. Therefore, I'd like to show you how to start the DCS F-14 by the book, like in real life, following the NATOPS. We're gonna go through all the pre-start and post-start checks too, because that's the way I like to play DCS. So, if you just all tabbed out of DCS to quickly learn how to start the jet because you're eager to get in the air, this is not the tutorial you want to watch. It's for those who want to start the jet following real-world procedures and also want to understand why those steps are required. In the sim, every system of the jet works perfectly every time you start, so you can get away with a much shorter startup procedure, but having all these systems modeled, for me, it's part of the fun. Starting it in a quick and dirty way is like mixing a bottle of Talisker whiskey with coke and chugging it down. Come on, there's Jim Beam for that. One of the reasons why I love DCS is that we can geek out over all these switches and pretend we're sitting in a real-life Tomcat. So I'm going to try to explain why each step is done the way it is, but without going into too much detail. Alright, let's begin with the pre-start procedure. Normally, you'd walk around the jet checking all the different parts, but there's no point in doing that in DCS. You can't grab and give the tail hook a shove, for example. So, once you enter the cockpit, you need to make sure every switch and lever is in the right position, ready for startup. In DCS, they always are, uh, most of them anyway. So I'm only going to show you the ones that need your attention sweeping from left to right, so that we don't forget anything. First, you flip the oxygen on and pretend to take a deep breath to check your mask. You set the vent airflow thumb wheel, not that you'll have any air blown at you from your screen. Then, you set the radio and ICS volumes. This is going to be important depending on what your sound setting sliders look like. I like to turn the back radio to max volume, and the same for the front radio. You'll need to move your head a little, it's blocked by the throttle. Then this one is the ICS volume knob, and it controls how loud gesture should be. I like to lower it quite a bit. Then you set the altimeter to the local Q&H pressure, so that it displays your altitude over the sea level. You'll find it in the briefing, or in my campaigns, you may need to check the ATIS or listen to the 5MC announcement on the carrier deck. Moving on to the right, you set the bingo here, according to the briefing. For some reason, the numbers move very slowly, so you need to turn it a lot. Over here, we set the ammo counter, because by default, it's set to zero, and people have already asked me why the gun is not loaded in my campaigns. Well, here's your answer. Turn it all the way up. Then we move down here and set the gun peeper manual elevation. This is for situations when you fire the Vulcan cannon without radar lock. It needs to be set to plus 53. Flick the hook bypass switch to field or carrier, depending on the situation. If it's set to carrier and you want to land with the hook up, the AOA indexer will flash to warn you. You set the cockpit and external lights as desired or as required by the mission, depending on the time of day. I like to crank up all my instrument lights to have better visibility. You set the air conditioning as desired, set the thumb wheel to a mid-range of 5 to 7. This controls how hot your graphics card will run. And finally, this is important, set the bidirectional hydraulic transfer pump, or bidi, here, to the shutoff position by raising the red guard and then flipping the switch up. Your Tomcat is ready to start. It's an older jet, uh, designed from the early 70s. It doesn't have an APU, it can't just start on its own, like a Hornet for example. So you open the radio menu and ask the ground crew to connect ground electric power. Chief, turn on the ground power. You do a quick ICS comm check with your Rio to see if you can hear each other. Then it's time to do some tests to make sure it's worth starting the jet at all. This here is the master test button. You raise it, turn it to the desired test, then lower it to run that test. 
first one you need is the lights test. This will illuminate every light in the cockpit like a Christmas tree. It's important to know that, for example, the master caution light is off because there really is no problem, not because of a faulty bulb. Then you raise the knob and move it over to fire DET EXT. This will initiate the test of the fire detection and extinguishing system. Check the left and right fire lights come on and you'll see a green go light when it's done, hopefully. Then you move it to INS to check the instruments. This will make the tapes come alive to make sure they work, like the engine instrument tapes, wing sweep and AOA indicators and the fuel tapes. You'll also get the engine stall warning lights and sound triggered by the high EGT indication. If all is good, turn it back off and we're ready to go. Arm your ejection seat and close the canopy. You ask the plane captain to plug the huffer card aft of the left main landing gear, or in DCS to connect ground air supply. Chief, connect ground air supply. This is a cart that basically blows compressed air into the engines to run the starter when you crank the engines. The next step is to bleed the hydraulics. Both hydraulic system pressures should indicate zero in order to fully test the emergency modes after this. So to get rid of any remaining hydraulic pressure, you crank the left engine, the troubleshooter is out there on the left pushing a button and signals the plane captain when he's got a good bleed. You recenter the crank switch, then he runs over to the right and repeats the performance. By the way, moving the crank switch automatically triggers the Jester AI to begin his startup procedure in the back seat. You don't even need to use the menu. Once that's done, you test the emergency flight hydraulic pumps to backup modes. In a nutshell, if there's a hydraulic failure and both sides pressure drops below 2100 PSI, the emergency pump comes on. It has two modes. One allows more control surface movement for a shorter time, good for landing and stuff, and the other one is more limited but lasts longer, good for making it back home. So you raise the guard and flick it to low. You check if the low flag comes on in this window and move your stick and rudder around gently to see if it works and the control surfaces actually move at 5 degrees per second. Then you do the same in the high position. Note that it should allow for a higher control surface deflection than low, at 10 degrees per second. If everything looks good, you flick it back to auto and close the guard. At this point, we're ready to actually start the engines. We begin with the right engine as per the NATOPS, but the order shouldn't matter. You move the crank switch to the right and look at the RPM tape as it starts rising. At 20%, you introduce fuel by moving the right throttle around the horn into the idle position. Fuel flow and EGT will start rising. At 50% RPM, the solenoid held crank switch needs to automatically return to the center position. You make sure the EGT doesn't exceed 890 Celsius, then check your right generator and right fuel pressure lights out. The RPM should stabilize between 62 and 78 percent, EGT around 500 Celsius, fuel flow between 950 and 1400 pounds per hour, oil pressure between 25 and 35 psi, and the hydraulic pressure on the flight side should rise to 3000 psi. If everything looks good, you can ask the plane captain to disconnect the electric power now because the right engine driven generator is up and running. Now before we start the left engine, we test the bi-di or the bidirectional hydraulic transfer pump. There are two hydraulic systems. The combined side is driven by the left engine and the flight side by the right engine. Each one supplies power to the control surfaces but each one supplies to different secondary systems. If one should fail, the bi-di pump pressurizes the fault side from the good side. If the pressure drops below 2100 but it's above 500, on one side, it automatically turns on and keeps it between 2400 and 2600. We need to make sure it works. So we crank the left engine 
and let the pressure on the combined side build up to 3000 psi. We simulate a hydraulic failure by moving the crank switch back to center, then switch the by die to normal to see if it pressurizes the combined side within 5 seconds and keep the pressure up. If not, we shut it off immediately before it burns itself up. It does, all good, so we flick the by die back to shut off. Now we can start the left engine. The procedure is the same, crank left, then throttles to idle at 20% and keep your eyes on the instruments. When the left engine is running and the RPM stabilized, we can tell the plane captain to disconnect the starter air. Chief, disconnect ground air supply. That whooshing sound will stop. Then we cycle the air source, first left engine, then right engine, then both. We verify that there's an audible airflow in all three positions. If you forget this, you won't only be left without AC, but the guns won't fire either due to lack of cooling. Rookie mistake. Also, now we can switch the by die to normal and close the red guard. This was the actual engine start procedure. Now come the post start checks. Turn on all three stab aux switches. Then we test the emergency generator. We move the master test switch to emerge gen. Clear any caution or advisory lights with the master reset button. Then once you get a green go light, in DCS this test is not modeled, you move the master test back to off and press the master reset button once again. Then we can turn on the displays, the HUD, the VDI and the HSD. Then comes a step that's only relevant in the B model. If you're flying an A, you can skip it. We check the AFTC, the Augmenter Fan Temperature Control the engine's brain that controls them in primary mode. Should it fail, there's a hydromechanical main engine control that kicks in in secondary mode, with some limitations like an inhibited afterburner for example. Switch the left engine mode to SEC. Check if the SEC caution light comes on, the RPM should drop a little, and the nozzle indicator needle should drop below zero. If all is good, advance the left throttle a bit to make sure there is an engine response. Then we switch it back to pry and watch the nozzle indicator go to 100%. Let's repeat the same with the right engine. Alright, engines look good. So now we can turn on everything else we need. Make sure the emergency wing sweep handle is in the oversweep position. In DCS, it's always there. Move the wing sweep control switch on the throttle to auto. Note, the wings won't move just yet because the emergency wing sweep handle is in the oversweep position. Wing X trans switch off. So in the default auto position, fuel transfer from the wing tanks and the drop tanks is shut off with weight on wheels, but there's always a tiny possibility that the weight on wheels sensor fails. So to make sure fuel is not transferred while we're on the ground, we flick it to off. Why don't we want fuel to be transferred? Very good question, and if you know the answer, please let me know in the comments. According to a few versions I've heard, we don't want to dump fuel accidentally through the vents, and or we want the wing tanks full because if they're not, the fuel may be sloshing, causing center of gravity or structural stress problems during takeoff, especially a cat launch. Then we turn on the comms. Tech end to transmit receive, channel set, but mostly it will be the Rio setting the channels. Turn the radio to both. Make sure the trim is set to zero, zero, zero. Otherwise you'll have problems later during the OBC jacks. Turn on the rate alt, set it as desired, 
Reset the altimeter by holding this little switch for 3 seconds until the standby flag is gone. Erect the standby gyro. Turn on the ARA-63, so the ICLS. Then, finally, press the master reset button. Everything we need is up and running at this point, but we still need to perform some tests and checks to make sure all systems are working properly. We begin by moving the master test switch to OBC, then engaging the autopilot switch. This will initiate an automatic test of various avionics, flight controls, trim system, the pitch parallel actuators, the rudder pedal shakers, the FEMS or fatigue engine monitoring system, the AICS or air inlet control system. It will move the inlet ramps around by cycling the ramp actuators through their full range and stuff like that. While it's running, we coordinate with the plane captain and his helpers to check the speed brakes. We extend them fully, then retract. To fully extend, you must hold the switch, but as soon as you move the switch forward just a bit, it will automatically retract fully without having to hold it there. Then we extend the refuel probe, check that everything looks good, transition light out, then retract it. Then you cycle the windshield air and look for dust being blown in front of the windshield. When the OBC test is done, it's not yet implemented in DCS, you move the master test switch back to off. And it should automatically switch the autopilot off when it's done, but not in DCS, so we do that manually. Having extended the refuel probe, should automatically have flipped the wing X trans switch back to auto. So now we put it back to off. Then we check the trim. We run them through their full range, nose up, nose down, left and right, then set it back to zero, zero, zero. Now it's time to spread the wings and test everything related to them. But if you're on a carrier with jets parked inches from each other, you don't have the space to do this, so you can skip ahead. We've already moved the switch on the throttle to auto. Now we move the emergency wing sweep handle to 20 degrees all the way forward and then lower it into the spider detent there. We watch the wings come forward, then we press the master reset button. This will activate the auto mode. The plane captain checks if all the exterior lights are working. Just make sure the lights master switch on your throttle is on. Lower the flaps and slats. Verify they come down. Then cycle the flight controls and check for full and unrestricted movement. Then check the DLC, or Direct Lift Control. You pop out the inboard spoilers halfway with this button on the side of your stick, then move them with the spring-loaded thumb wheel. Watch them extend and retract fully. Also, verify that the stabilators move a few degrees automatically when the DLC is engaged to make up for its effect on the pitch trim. Deselect DLC when it's all done. Move the anti-skid spoiler brake switch to spoiler brake. As long as the throttles are in idle and the flaps are down, all the spoilers should now come up to help you stop after a landing on a runway. Verify that they retract automatically when you nudge the throttles forward a bit. Doing a go around with the spoilers up is not one of the secrets to a long life. Once the check is complete, turn the switch back to off. Raise the flaps and slats. Then lower the maneuver flaps fully using the same spring-loaded thumb wheel you are used to operate the DLC. Manually move the wings back to 50 degrees using the switch on the throttle. Check that the maneuver flaps are still down and working by cracking them up just a tad. Now move the wing sweep control switch to bomb mode. This will automatically move the wings back to 55 degrees and the maneuver flaps should retract automatically. When they do, 
sweep the wings back all the way to 68 degrees. Then raise the emergency handle, wait a few seconds until the wing gloss sealing place deflate, then move it all the way back to the oversweep position to sweep the wings back to 75 degrees for ground ops. You're less likely to hit stuff and piss people off. Move the control switch back to auto and depress the master reset button. Okay, wings are done. If you're on the carrier deck, it's time to wake up because the next step applies to you again. The anti-skid bit test. Only do this once your Rio is done with the INS alignment though. Move the switch to both, release the parking brake and hold the brakes. The troubleshooter will go to the nose rear well and press a button to run the bit test. In real life, you should feel the brake pressure on the paddles release. When he gets a good bit flag, you can turn on the parking brake again and move the anti-skid switch back to off. Okay, let's run the radar altimeter bit. Press and hold this button, the green test light should illuminate and the needle should show 100 feet plus minus 10. Now run the tech hand bit by pressing this button. Both lights should illuminate at the start to let you know they work and then after 22 seconds you get a green or a red light when the test is finished. Then we run the ICLS bit to make sure those needles work and we can follow them. You switch the PDCP to landing mode, steer command to AWL PCD, HUD and VDI to ILS, then press and hold this button. The vertical needle should slowly oscillate left and right while the horizontal needle should remain centered. Alright, time for the final checks. No strut switch, kneel. Check that the launch bar is down. Drop the tail hook and the ground crew will inspect everything. Check that the RAT's advisory light is on. It's the reduced arrestment thrust system and it's only applicable for the F-110 engines of the F-14B. You see, with weight on wheels and the hook down, it will reduce the mill power thrust by 20 to 25% to reduce wear on the arresting gear after a trap. Imagine how powerful those F-110s are if such a system is required. Now cycle the launch bar aboard switch here, verify that it works, and then bring the nose strut back up and raise the hook. Also, check if the fuel transfer works. Flick the wing X transfer switch to override, then hold the quantity display switch in the external position and verify the quantity is decreasing. Don't forget to flick the switch back to auto before taxiing. This will be part of the takeoff checklist too. Now cycle the nose wheel steering on and off and turn it on. Tell the plane captain to remove the wheel chocks, the wheel then chocks. release the parking brakes and you're ready to go. Okay, that's it. I hope you found this tutorial interesting and useful and managed to learn something new today. Now you know how to start your DCS F-14 Tomcat just like in real life, following the NATOPS. I'll put a link to the checklist in the video description. If you are looking for more in-depth information, check out the video link in the description. It's a two hour long video by a former Tomcat avionics technician and the amount of knowledge shared in there is mind blowing. Alright, better start practicing because knowing all this will be a prerequisite for your first familiarization flight in my Speed and Angels campaign. Like in real life, your instructor won't be holding your hand and pointing at switches. You're supposed to know the NATOPS inside out before strapping into a Tomcat. Alright, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell for more tutorials and campaign updates. See ya!